We are live. Ira Rothkin, so good to see you. Mitch Jackson here. We're going to be talking about NFTs, blockchain technology, maybe even a little crypto. I've got the man in the house, one of my go-to experts. For those of you, what's an NFT? How can I embrace and utilize NFT technology in my business with my services? You're an artist. You're a creator. You're hearing everybody talk about NFTs, but you don't know where to start. Well, you do now. You're starting right here on today's show because my guest is attorney er my attorney Ira Rothkin. Ira, it's so good to have you on the show today. Thank you for having me, Mitch Jackson. It's it's great to see the machinery you have and putting these on, and uh, I, I look forward to our conversation today. Well, fantastic. I'm looking forward to sharing you with my community. And speaking of community, we are broadcasting live and taking your questions and comments from Twitter, different Facebook groups and pages, LinkedIn Live, YouTube, Amazon Live, and a few other platforms. So if you have a question about NFTs for Ira, you can ask those questions on the platform that you're watching this show from you can DM us your questions. I'm monitoring most of the platforms over on the right. You can text me at 1-800-661-7044, and I'll try to get your text-based questions over to Ira to be answered. Before we dive into the first question, what is an NFT? Let me give Ira a brief but appropriate introduction. Ira and his firm practice law in the areas of intellectual property litigation, including trademarks, trade secrets, copyrights, and patents. He also handles internet law, startups, complex business litigation, class action, video game law, video game litigation for all the video gamers in the world out there and in my circle, including my son, who's probably watching. Uh, business law, employment litigation, consumer protection litigation, personal injury and tort law, and also is someone who I've really enjoyed spending time with on social audio platforms such as Clubhouse and Twitter Spaces to talk about what? To talk about NFTs, to talk about blockchain technology. So that's who's on the show today. We're already getting a bunch of questions in, and we will get to all of your questions if we don't. I'll share some links where you can get in touch with Ira after the show. And if he's got time, maybe he can answer any questions that we haven't covered. But Ira, why don't we get started? What in the world is an NFT? Thanks, Mitch. <clears throat> Thanks for having me. Um, and it's, <clears throat> it's an honor to be here today. Um, you're the guru of social media <laughs> for lawyers. I see your name everywhere. And so I'm really Thank glad that, uh, that we have a chance to do this today. Um, okay, so what is NFT? <clears throat> Excuse me one second. All right, well, NFTs are somebody goes online, they see a really nice digital painting they want to buy, they buy it through using cryptocurrency, and then they own it, and that is completely wrong. That is not what an NFT is. But that's what everyone thinks an NFT is. So what is an NFT? An NFT is a, a, a small piece of data, unique data written to a blockchain. Uh, it is a non-fungible token. So the data is unique. Uh, and what makes an NFT into something that your viewers and we all know as a society right now is it has usually one link usually to something known as an IPFS server. And that link is essentially a link to metadata that then will point to the content that somebody purchases. So the NFT itself is a hash on the blockchain. That's a receipt for that data. Everything else resides off chain. And that is the thing that people really commonly don't understand about NFTs. It is a hash on the blockchain nothing more, nothing less. And all the stuff that people enjoy about NFTs resides off chain, either in something known as an IPFS server, which we can get to later, or even central servers. And that's the thing that somebody feels like they're buying, but they're not, they're probably licensing it. And it's probably a non-commercial, non-exclusive license. So let me jump back in because this is the ABCs of NFTs. And we have people that 
are hearing about NFTs for the first time. We have a lot of mutual friends, Ira, in our other social media communities that are still trying to figure out this convoluted, multiple opinionated, what in the world's going on type of technology here. You mentioned the term blockchain. And if I interrupt you to define something, excuse me in advance. I'm not trying to be rude, but I'm just paying attention to the questions that we're getting in the comments. You mentioned the blockchain. What is a blockchain and how do blockchains relate to NFTs? Well, the easiest way to describe a blockchain is it's a decentralized ledger that uses encryption to create uh, something that's immutable and something that has a high degree of credibility. Each, each data piece on the blockchain is connected to the next through encryption. So whether it is the Bitcoin blockchain or the Ethereum blockchain, which is commonly used for NFTs, or Solana, or Hedera, or others, Tezos, uh, they usually act the same. Some blockchains use something known as proof of work, which would be Bitcoin. And proof of work requires a lot of computing power and a lot of energy. And so it's not as carbon friendly, say, as proof of stake, like Solana, uh, like Hedera, which uses uh, less energy because you don't have to, you, you, it, it, it's not a proof of work system. So proof of stake is something that's a little bit more algorithmic and it doesn't require much energy at all. So that's what a blockchain is generally. Okay. And the reason I was bringing it up is that we have all types of people watching today's show, Ira. We have probably some friends of yours, some IP, intellectual property, uh, right, lawyers, some blockchain lawyers. We've got some artists, some creators. We've got some investors. We got people that either own or are thinking about starting their own NFT type of platform. So we're going to be coming at today's program from a bunch of different angles. And you've got the green light, my friend, to popcorn all over the place and answer any of these questions through any lens that you'd like to use, whether you're an artist uploading his or her or their first piece of art, whether or not you're hosting a platform that's accepting NFTs or you're an investor that's approaching all of the above through the investor's eyes. Um, and with that in mind, one of the questions we, we did get is when it comes to blockchain and NFTs, Ira, who owns this technology? If I'm an artist and I, I create an NFT from a piece of original work, and I, is the terminology, do I upload it onto an NFT platform? And if so, who owns that, that NFT? The word own is a loaded term mm -hmm. because what it means in law could be different than what it means in terms of course of performance and common usage. Um, I'm going to start with a scenario where an artist makes an original work and it's unequivocal that they own the copyrights to it. So the use of the word own there is owns the copyrights to it. Uh, and then they go ahead and they upload it to say OpenSea or Rarible or one of the other large platforms. Uh, the process of doing that, the artist owns the content of that NFT. The artist is then permitted to upload it because when you go to these platforms, you're representing and warranting that you have the authorization or that you own it, that you own the copyrights to it. If you don't, you got to do that before. You got to get those rights before you upload. If you don't have those rights, you're basically lying to the platform and you're going to be responsible for all damages that approximately cost. I mean, it's, you could read these agreements. They pretty much have everyone rep and warrant that they own it. Right, so now we're authorized to, to upload it. So now they upload it. The platform now has a very broad license to market it and to mint it. And minting is essentially the stages of attaching a contract, a smart contract, um, to the content. And that makes up the NFT. The smart contract, uh, depending upon what blockchain you're on, is done with a certain standard. And now it's manifested on that platform. The platform still has that license. Ultimately, when somebody uh, goes ahead and buys that NFT, it usually involves uh, their smart, their wallet, like, like MetaMask, 
okay. getting, a call, getting a call from that platform and through an API application programming interface. Can I give you a timeout? Out. Can I time out real yeah. quick? Sure. Just, just so if you, if just think about where you are, because I want to come back to this, but you mentioned a couple of things, uh, smart contracts. And I know a lot of our viewers aren't familiar with what a smart contract is. Maybe what's a smart contract and how does that relate to NFTs? I'll go with smart contracts generally because each blockchain, they're similar, but not identical. Um, and a smart contract is basically software code on Ethereum. It's written usually in Solidity. Um, and the easiest way to describe it in what we call pseudocode, in other words, converting code to English, is a bunch of if-then statements. And the most well-known smart contracts are basically the greatest escrow algorithm the world's ever seen. Uh, on one hand, uh, it's attached to an NFT. And on the other hand, it's waiting for a payment, in this instance, say in Ethereum. And then it only allows for the algorithm Whoops. Can you hear me? Oh, you're muted, my friend. Let me uh, check your mic at this end. Edit mic settings. I'm going to see if I can make sure we're okay. Yeah, so we are. there we go. Yeah, so, sorry. Sorry. So wait a minute. Time, what just happened? Yeah. Was that an NFT? Was that a blockchain? Was that a uh, smart contract or was that human error? What it was just poor happened? Engineer, it was poor engineering by Apple Incorporated that knocked <laughs> my camera off when a phone call comes into my iPhone. Gotcha. Uh, which, gotcha. Is very, you know, which, which, you know. So, uh, so basically, it's a bunch of if-then statements. And those if-then statements make it so that the NFT gets transferred only if a certain amount of Ethereum is in existence. And then the two shake hands and the transaction occurs automatically so it is a trustless system and that's what makes it so powerful is that you can't have one of those old comedic routines where someone grabs the apple and doesn't pay for it the, those two things right. must happen algorithmically uh through the um ethereum virtual machine so the terminology that you're using, you're used to using, it's commonplace in your world. I've got a lot of people that are asking for definitions of certain things. And let me just encourage everyone, because I do want to cover a lot of material and some specific examples with Ira that I think all of you are really going to enjoy. So if during the show you hear Ira mention a particular type of terminology you're not familiar with, go to Google. Check it out real quick. You'll get a quick definition. And then I won't interrupt Ira by asking him to define something that's literally a five-second Google search away. So we appreciate your feedback and comments. And I just wanted everyone to know I'm not ignoring you, but I also want to make sure we get an hour's worth of Ira Rothkin uh, about NFTs. Ira, you mentioned this, this type of marketplace, the NFT marketplace. What is the NFT marketplace like in your mind, maybe looking at it from the consumer's perspective, the platform provider's perspective, and maybe from an investor's perspective? From the consumer's perspective, it is a place to go and find and purchase NFTs. Um, typically, they're images, but they don't have to be. And more and more, they're becoming things like memberships, and VIP passes. And so it's a place for, for folks to, to discover and to purchase NFTs, typically using uh, a wallet like MetaMask. Uh, and there's descriptions. There's also auction functionality. Uh, Shopify would be a good metaphor in regular e-commerce along with, uh, you know, eBay. So Shopify and eBay would be you know, perfect examples, uh, but usually for digital, digital art or digital content, sometimes again, memberships, the, from the platform perspective, from the seller's perspective, it's a place they can go to upload their offering and to be able to get paid typically in, in cryptocurrency without having to worry about 
all of the inner workings of how it works and the sophistication of it. It's basically what I'll call NFT as a service. They don't have to worry about those things, OpenSea, Rarible, Foundation. They handle all those nuances, all the security, and, uh, and take care of the transaction, usually for a percentage of the fee. Um, hey, uh, Ira, so Mark. From the platform's perspective, I was just, I'm sorry, you mentioned OpenSea and Mark uh, asked, what's your favorite NFT marketplace that is not OpenSea? So I'd like to interject questions as they come in. I didn't mean to interrupt you. All right. Um, I don't have a favorite. Um, I know that's kind of like a, a cop-out answer, but I really don't. I think, um, I think OpenSea is great because they have the greatest diversity of sellers um you've got rarible foundation um you know there's so many there's so many good ones that i really think it would be unfair for me to elevate one over another um i like them all for different reasons i even like um you know um some of the white label ones that allow folks to not even have their visitors going to someone else's site. So for a lot of uh, content owners, a lot of artists, it may make a lot of sense for them to have their own domain with a few lines of code. They can embed their own white label. Um, one of the ones I like, but with full disclosure, I own part of is infiniteworld.com. Uh, they have an offering that allows anybody to have their own NFT store. And this month they're rolling out a lot of those stores in a very, and it's a way similar to what Shopify is. You can get your own domain and they handle all of the complexity and, um, and folks will be able to then keep all the traffic to their domain, keep all their customers signing up for them. And that really allows for a brand to maintain their equity in the traffic. So what was the name of your, your platform again? Uh, you just mentioned infinite world.com yeah, infinite world. Com. Okay. Infinite world.com. And the reason I'm asking you is if, if, if I was a, an ordinary consumer, let's just say I'm an artist and I'm doing some type of artwork or graphical artwork. And I want to use your platform to, upload to post to drop whatever the terminology is maybe you can educate me on that to promote sell or highlight my work how does that work using your platform walk us through the steps because it's not as simple as i would like it to be as a consumer to upload nfts i have on OpenSea just to see how it works some of my beach photographs but using your platform walk us through i'm, I'm an artist i'm not very good with digital or tech but I want to post my content on your site. What are the steps from the 30,000 foot level that I need to take to make that happen? Uh, the, the, uh, the simplistic answer to that is that infinite world is not meant as an open access system for anyone to upload. Uh, it's meant for brands, typically large brands, Hollywood studios, uh, <clears throat> major car manufacturers and they get they're given a console back end um, and they could upload through that console back end I, I think in responding to your question you know the process for anyone in uploading works uh, is for you know for there to be a very simplistic upload button for, and then you upload in some scenarios the actual file and other scenarios you point to it um, through a URL and then it would be uploaded in some instances a codec would be applied if you choose that route in other instances it's kept what exactly is that? as is and the plat and, and, and the platform would then automatically in the background analyze the content depends upon what platform it is and do some what I know what I called heuristics on it to determine whether or not it's fraudulent or infringing. Um, and that kind of um, due diligence is done usually automatically 
it is by far away not a perfect process. And you also have to undergo on most platforms some degree of KYC. They have to know their customer. And that would include having to give over what's known as personal identifying information. And then it gets verified. So it's not the quickest process. A lot of the stuff is automated. And this type of process is undergoing evolution as best practices um, are, are contemplated and, and, and they're evolving. So um, that's, and then ultimately uh, the uh, content itself will get minted, as I described earlier, what minting is, and then offered to the public through the platform, either for sale or by auction. So one of the related questions I, I, I get, and I, I've gotten a couple of times live, is what do you see, for example, on an artist walking into an art gallery in real in the real world? Uh, let's just say they know the owner of the gallery. They walk in. Here's my painting. They work out a deal to, for a commission sale, hang it on the wall. You've kind of described how that works in the digital world with NFTs and just moving forward, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you see artists or creators making while going through this process? There's so many, uh, so many mistakes that I've seen. I'll try uh, to recount some of them in no particular order. Um, I think maybe number one would be they don't clear their own rights. Uh, so, you know, an artist may uh, borrow too much of somebody, someone else's intellectual property uh, and not, you know, if they go ahead and, and use someone famous in their photograph, um, you know, depending upon the context, you know, you may have a First Amendment defense to that or fair use, we'll call it, for, for even for use of likeness. But you usually have to go ahead in many instances and get permission from either the uh, famous person or their estate. Because if something started out as a newsworthy photograph, for example, you may have an exception under the right of publicity statutes for publishing that as hot news. But that mm. same exception may not apply when you want to monetize it years later as a for-profit NFT in a commercial sale. And so there's so many nuances, same thing with copyright, um, if you have your borrowing thing, you may, you may be able to rely on fair use, but maybe you can't. And so those things many times are expensive. Then on top of all that, there could be footage that a producer may have on their laptop. Let's say they have a famous musician, um, and they may own uh, certain rights to that footage, but maybe not all the rights. And so you got to go through all the rights clearances that lawyers typically go through in Hollywood, in the video game industry. Um, and so one has to evaluate when they come across these complex scenarios, whether or not it's economically viable to list the NFT in light of the rights clearances they have to go through. Hmm. Um, other instances of mistakes made is if it's a, if you work with a team and each one contributes, whether or not you have a joint copyright agreement that allocates who gets what and what rights everyone has in the joint copyright uh, to prevent, you know, fighting later on. Um, another mistake that people make is they don't register their copyrights uh, in the NFT content. So, you know, just a few years ago, there was a very well-known court case that came down where the, you know, the court came back and basically said, hey, um, you don't have the keys to the courthouse to sue for copyright infringement if you've never registered successfully your copyright. And they said it wasn't enough for you even to just file to register. The registration has to be completed before you could file a copyright infringement lawsuit. And so you have a scenario now where a lot of folks are excited to get their NFTs online. They don't expedite the copyright registration process. And if someone infringes, maybe you could do a DMCA takedown notice, but you can't get into mm -hmm. the courthouse in the United States to file for a copyright infringement or for an injunction 
when it is a U.S. copyright. And so, you know, that's just a few of many mistakes <laughs> that I've seen NFT artists make. You know, you're so casual and correct about pointing out the intellectual property mistakes that we both see artists and creators make because oftentimes they don't know any better. And, and, and I think what I'm hearing and neither you or I are sharing any legal advice during today's show, right? On the live video, on the audio, we're just having a conversation. We do both encourage everyone yes. Check with a qualified lawyer in your state, your country, in your region. If you have any questions about anything that Ira and I are chatting about today, or reach out to Ira privately. And for example, Ira, with my firm, unless somebody signs a written retire retainer agreement, unless there's an agreement to represent, there's no attorney-client uh, 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 relationship or representation. I'm sure that applies to your firm too. So everybody just make sure that you yes. retain counsel, right? If you're going to be diving headfirst into the space, because it's very, very complicated. And I'll tell you something else that's complicated in addition to intellectual property. And that is what in the world can artists or should artists charge for their NFTs? And my dear friend, Peter Grell, asked this question. He's out of Canada. What determines the value of an NFT? So we've got our NFT. We protected and secured whatever intellectual property rights need to be secured, contracted for, what have you, registered. And now we're ready and we've uploaded it to one or more of the platforms, Ira, that you've mentioned. How in the world can we figure out what we should place or ask as a starting price or a final price? What are your thoughts on that? It is uh, an art, which is ironic. It's an art, not a science, to determine the value of NFT. Um, and some of it could come across as bordering on unseemly. The, um, you know, with Beeple, one of the very first NFTs, what I'll, in, I'll call in this phase, earlier this year, I think it was $69 million, it went for at auction, his work. Um, and that's basically what the market will bear. And now tell everybody what, what, what you're referring to, because it. that's, it tell everybody what it. you're referring to. Somebody yeah. sold something for $69 million. Isn't that right? The thing that people sold for 60, $69 million was basically a JPEG or ping PNG image. It was a okay. single image and uh, it was a mosaic of a lot of different artwork that he did on social media over the years. It was one of the very first major auctions by an auction house, um, a well-known auction house who wanted to get involved in NFTs. And when the bidding was done, it was $69 million. And that's for the, the single NFT image. And again, it's important to, for everyone to, re to realize that NFT, when you examine it, and, you know, Mitch knows I did examine it, was one line of code that ultimately in the smart contract, when you manifest the NFT, it was one link to an IPFS server, which is a peer-to-peer -peer server. And it brought you to something called a JSON file, which was a bunch of metadata. And that JSON file pointed to, on another part of the IPFS server, the peer-to-peer -peer server, the actual content JPEG which was Beeple's image, okay? Most of what happened there was not on the blockchain. The, the major thing on the blockchain was the hash that pointed off chain to the IPFS server. That went for $69 million. If I had to say what determines the value of an NFT, I think I'm on safe ground by basically saying that it is the amount that society perceives it is, and that right. now is more modernly related towards the hype, the public relations, some of what people call community, and um, the value of the actual token itself. And modernly, we've gone beyond people to an era where the image doesn't matter that people are buying as much. 
that in many ways it's artwork with unknown artists, like something called the Bored Apes Project, which has beautiful looking apes. But the artist was hired to make those apes, and they're not part of the feature of the NFT, but rather people loved it because it was Bored Apes Yacht Club, and they <laughs> wanted to be part of the club. So they manifest this, this image um, of an ape. They're all different. And that made them part of the club. And now it was the token itself, the hash, that gave them access to things after the purchase, the utility, future drops, future images, future perhaps uh, use um, on T-shirts and what have you. That's what utility that token had. And Bored Apes also became a multi-million dollar uh, valuation uh, on its NFTs. And so if I had to say currently what the best indicia of value of an NFT is, it would be write or use some software that looks for social media and press mentions of the project. And I would argue there's a correlation between that and the value of the NFT. Mm. You know, with some of the numbers, uh, Peter was kind enough to share uh, Dorsey's uh, NFT tweet sale for, I guess, $2.9 million. Because there's some zeros involved in what you're chatting about, Ira, can you um, talk to us a little bit about what originators, creators, maybe it's me doing an NFT of a jury verdict, creating new law in the state of California, for example. It's something I'm thinking about doing. I've got the special verdict sheet. And and now the uh, owners of dogs that are intentionally harmed by the wrongdoing of a third parse person uh, have the right to bring an intentional infliction of emotional distress case for the harm that they experience watching their pet get hurt. Um, it's, it's something that might resonate with other people. So when we create these NFTs, whoever we are, and we upload them into the platforms that you've talked about, I guess my next follow-up question is, can we invest? Is there an investment opportunity for third parties in NFTs? And if there's an investment opportunity, such as looking at fine art or investing in a nice bottle of wine or investing in, you know, a famous dress that somebody once wore, for example, um, what should investors be looking for, looking at their due diligence before investing in a particular NFT? Any thoughts, any tips? Well, there is a lot of room for due diligence. The, I'm hopeful that the NFT ecosystem will self-regulate so there doesn't have to be governmental regulation. Um, but there's a whole host of things that buyers should look for. And in some ways the most successful buyers of NFTs are inadvertently perhaps aiders and abettors in the things that makes NFTs somewhat dubious. So, um, and so that creates a problem as well. So I'll give you an example of that. Um, if there are projects going on where there isn't a lot of transparency and certain folks are being able to get drops of the NFTs in a collection ahead of time. Other people may get very low prices called the floor. And no one knows who's in that category, but they go on social media and they really promote the hell out of it. It does create a climate where buyers, especially unsophisticated buyers, may rely upon those what I'll call promoters in a very excessive way. And each promoter is no longer just judging it on the art. They're like what I'll call folks in affiliate programs online. They know there's a correlation in many instances between their promotion and the hype from it and the value of the NFT because that can create demand, especially if the promoters are well thought of, are trusted, are advocates, 
And so now you have this ecosystem, which in some ways can get rather unhealthy. Um, and then other folks may come in way later. And in some instances, the value of NFTs can then decline because the early promoters sell out. In some instances, it's called pulling the rug. And so mm. when you don't have transparency, and then, and then on top of all that, we're in a climate where there are some NFTs, to be sure, that have beautiful art, genius art. But there are others where the art might as well be clip art, where they hire, you know, some artists to do work made for hires. They're right. not featured. And all they are, 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 are part of the collectibles environment. And then they put on a draw, landing page, a roadmap. So now you have this art, you have no transparency into the influencers involved and their stake. And then you have a roadmap, but you don't know whether or not the team has the ability, the quality, the integrity, the, the character to follow through on that roadmap. And you certainly don't know if, if that will um, be something that will increase the price later on. And that has created a very risky environment right now, unduly risky. And to be sure, there are some teams that are implementing these projects brilliantly. You know, I look over at Time Magazine um, and their efforts. People are getting full access to the Time Magazine archives as part of a membership. Okay, that's not like something that's theoretical. They're getting pretty good disclosure. There are still warts, in my view, with some of the things that they did in terms of their of their promotion, but there are others where the roadmaps go through all sorts of tremendous things and then they disappear. And so what could a buyer do in this environment? Well, to be honest with you, the very best buyers are the people who get it for nothing or who get it at the very beginnings of it for like 0.1 ETH and they're the ones who then go ahead and advocate it to others. Now, I'm not I'm saying that people should go and do nefarious things. But the logic behind that is pretty sound. Unless you're in at the beginning, everything else becomes kind of a crapshoot. And some people may wish to do that. But I think for a large number of consumers who are unsophisticated, it could be a trap for the unwary. So I don't really have any guidance i could say i'm looking forward to their becoming best practices in this business that folks who are in early or who are influencers or are being paid by the project have to disclose it in a robust way and that um, there needs to be some sort of check and balance on future promises and you know there needs to be some sort a very easy dispute resolution system so folks can get a remedy if they feel aggrieved. So that's kind of my not per, not very satisfying answer to your question. It was a very good answer to my question because people need to do their due diligence and they need to do their research. And I think also incorporated Ira into your response. And by the way, everyone, I'm speaking with Ira Rothkin, a technology lawyer, very well known. We're across all the platforms, everybody. Please hit the share button, share this out, ask your questions. I'll try to get to the several dozen questions that are already sitting on my admin board here, Ira, but we're going to focus on our on our talking points and get through this in one piece within the hour. Um, there's also the state, national, international, legal jurisdiction venue aspects of what you just described. So even when you're doing your due diligence, if you find that somebody, let's say you and I are in California and the wrongdoer lives on the other side of the, of the Atlantic, it can be a challenge to hold him, her, or, or they responsible for their wrongdoing. Talk to us just a little bit about how jurisdiction and international law and personal jurisdiction come into play when we're dealing with this type of technology. There's probably about five parties 
that would be relevant to that inquiry. Um, you know, first, the government, they would have jurisdiction for acts that touch their geography. And since the Internet is global, it's very statistically likely that almost any country will have some basis upon which to take action against an NFT project or, you know, or um, in terms of uh, the platform, jurisdiction is usually uh, indicated by in the terms of use through a choice of form and a choice of law clause. And typically, if the platform is doing things optimally for the platform, they would have arbitration in a favorable forum. They'd have a class action waiver, and uh, and they would have a, a you know a convenient forum in law. You know, for Dapper, for example, they 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 got sued a few months ago for their work on NBA Top Shots, but they have a forum selection for choice of forum being arbitration in Vancouver, in British Columbia, Canada. So I'm not sure of the status of that case. But that's an example uh, there. Now, in terms of the seller, uh, the seller will usually be bound to the platform's choice of form, the buyer as well. Um, if there is an aggrieved third party, let's say a copyright owner who's not part of this process, say a major Hollywood studio or someone feels like their material is being infringed, they could choose any form where that infringement's occurring, typically. And they'll usually you pick New York or California where they have, uh, you know, good good uh, locations for their executives. So um, that's kind of it. <coughs> yeah, it's it's you know any time that you have to go to the other side of the world to try to protect your rights or defend yourself, whatever it may have, it can get expensive. It be can become time consuming. It can be overwhelming. And so it's best to do your due diligence right off the top, meet with someone like Ira and get your questions answered uh, before taking those next couple of steps. I got a question here that I don't think we've covered, but it's something that I hear talked about all the time. And Ira, if you don't mind, what I want to do is try to go through four or five more questions, respect your time. But I think you're going to get a kick out of these questions because I know they all interest you. Um, gas fees. What's a what's an NFT gas fee? We hear about that all the time. What is it? <laughs> okay. Um a gas fee is a fee typically charged by miners for providing computing resources for processing a smart contract, typically through the Ethereum virtual machine. <laughs> so what, so, what um, does that, that mean? mean <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, Basically, what it means is that um, miners, and they could decide to accept or reject it. So, you know, they may decide that the amount of gas fee that someone's offering is too low and people get disappointed and they don't find a miner quickly and it could take a long time to process a smart contract. But Ethereum in its current form, and they're moving towards a proof of stake, but in, through, in its proof of work current form, um, miners are the folks who provide computing resources for the smart contracts to actually process and manifest. Um, and they charge a fee for that. And that fee is based upon supply and demand of computing resources. And that's also based upon what they have to pay in their overhead. So that's the best I can explain it in plain English. But just picture a lot, a lot, a lot of distributed little web hosting companies or, or, or Amazon AWSs who all get to decide whether or not they want to go ahead for the offer of gas to run an Ethereum virtual machine to process a given transaction. The Ethereum virtual machine is the distributed software that makes the Ethereum blockchain work. I think I partially understand what you just said, which even raises the need for all of us to get up to speed on exactly what Ira is sharing with us today. And everything you're talking about, Ira, comes back to the coding level. 
And I know that's something you're very passionate about. I know you grew up coding and gaming and things like this before you became an attorney. Uh, talk to us a little bit about your interest in the coding aspect of NFTs and what we all need to pay attention to moving forward when it comes to NFTs and the code. Well, smart contracts are not really contracts. They're smart algorithms. So people need to understand that the contract that counts right now for NFTs is literally a legal contract. And those legal contracts are usually found on the platform juxtaposed to the NFT sale. And that would let you know how you can use a particular NFT. My, um, my interest in programming, and I, you know, my programming interest went all the way back to the Commodore 64, where I used to program on the 6502 microprocessor, wow. and wow. Uh, um, and uh, I knew a lot of the folks involved in the very earliest years of the computing industry. But modernly, you know, I I'm a computer scientist and a lawyer, and I and I look at things that I'd like to be able to fix from a you know, law technology approach or, you know, legal technology. And there are, there are problems right now with the way NFTs are manifested and dealt with. Uh, one of the things that I'm working on is NFT shield. And you can read a little about it at nftshield.com. And one of the bugs that I'll call it a bug with NFTs, besides the notion that you can't have the content on chain in most instances, so it's mostly off-chain, is the notion that after the first sale on an NFT platform where somebody gets to see their, their contract, their legalese, uh, resales on Ethereum could occur on a different platform. So somebody, say, who's buying a particular work won't even know what the license agreement is because the other platform has absolutely no clue. So NFT okay. Shield is designed to actually fix that by having the legal contracts actually follow the NFT. And that's being done through a number of methods. Um, and I've been talking uh, to major wallet companies, including the folks from MetaMask and others. Um, but essentially, uh, we're, we're working on not only enhancing the JSON files and the metadata, so the contracts will manifest there, but also working with platforms so they'll read the additional fields in the metadata. So whatever platform it is could manifest essentially the, the license agreement in the NFT. That's what the consumer is buying. And if mm -hmm. the license agreement says something funny like you're buying air, it wouldn't be funny to the consumer that they can't read that. And then finally, we're working with wallet companies so when – the platforms call the wallet API uh, the additional information regarding the legal contract will manifest as part of a click through on any NFT transaction, you know, on wallets that are similar to MetaMask. So those are the things that I'm interested in right now, as well as digital rights management, the use of NFTs and video games um, requires a whole bunch of, of legal technology as well. So those are the sorts of things that, that I find interesting right now in the uh, NFT space. I, I love that. I'm so glad uh, that question was asked. And thank you for the answer. When you mentioned wallet, I know what you're talking about, but what is a digital wallet and how does that apply to NFTs? Just quickly, just so we can get some questions answered. It's not what I have uh, in my well, back Well, the typical pocket, example. Okay? The, <laughs> no, 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 it's not. Uh -huh. It's, it's um, you know, it's. It's very similar. Well, it's actually very similar to what most people have on their iPhone that Apple provides. It's it's basically uh, an interface that has your um, public facing uh, crypto addresses in them. In many instances, they have extra features that allow you to view galleries of your NFTs. MetaMask is perhaps the leading provider that's run by uh, the co-founder of Ethereum, um, Joe Lubin, and his company at Consensus. I believe that they are owners of MetaMask. And um, that is what 
is called by the platforms. When I say called, when they want to go ahead and finalize a transaction, they'll talk to the wallet API. It will then pop up. And very much like logging in by Facebook and logging in by Google, you now have to log in by MetaMask or another wallet. And, and then once you do that, you can consummate the transaction. It could also very importantly, and this is very important to the future of NFTs, it may become the most important single piece of software in the future of NFTs because that will allow you to go to any site, any membership site, um, whether it's Time Magazine or anyone else, and it will allow you to prove that you own a particular hash or a particular NFT. And that will allow you then to gain entrance so long as you own it, whether it's digital and online or you go into a VIP room at a concert. That wallet is going to become a very fundamental part of the uh, Internet society going forward if it's not already. Mm, I love that. I love you're sharing that towards the end of our show. And the wallet is what's always fascinated me. And we're talking about the digital wallet as it applies to blockchain, cryptocurrency and NFTs. And I think that leads me probably to my last question, Ira, and that is, what do you see the future being for NFTs? What do we have in store? What should we pay attention to, generally speaking? Or what would you like us to pay attention to as consumers moving forward in the NFT space? I see uh, a strong evolution towards better consumer protection, as I've indicated. Um, I see there being uh, self-regulation so that just like you'll see on the back of a can of food, calories and various types of ingredients, I believe that the IP stuff here matters. Uh, you know, when you go ahead and you buy antivirus software, uh, it's important for you to know how long the license is and how many folks are covered by it, whether it's three people, five people, your household, your business, and for one year. And just the same thing with NFTs, um, you're getting typically a non-commercial, uh, non-exclusive user license for personal use. Some NFTs promise commercial use, um, but that is a very difficult thing for them because, uh, Trademark law in many ways impedes naked licenses. So if they do that, they may run risk on their on their trademark rights. You can't have a lit, naked license. You need to exert quality control. So that sort of stuff will start to become more refined. But they're not, they're not going to shoot out ideas like, oh, commercial license. And, and they're going to be more thoughtful. And people, um, another problem that is going to be resolved going forward is that people are going to understand that when they buy an NFT, they're licensing it. And when you license something, if someone copies your NFT that you've licensed, you don't own the copyright, which means you can't sue to stop it. So if someone mm -hmm. takes your profile picture NFT and you have a, a non-exclusive license to it and someone else copies it and uses it as their profile picture, the only one who could sue is the project owner that owns the copyrights. And people will start understanding these things through this labeling system. They'll start understanding their rights. And, the th and NFTs will move in a very large way towards in-game assets, towards gating, and towards memberships. And the folks who can provide the greatest utility after the sale of NFTs, not before it, are going to win the day. And there'll certainly be startups that could do it. And, and folks who come out of one person shops, but it's going to open up a massive market for the major media companies to be able to use their legacy content to provide that utility. What an exciting conversation, Ira. I'm so glad that you took me up on my offer to have you on today's show. And for those of you joining us and have shared this out, asking your questions, I'm sorry, we couldn't get through probably more than 10% of the questions, Ira. But, you know, I did put up Ira's uh, website, techfirm.com. Ira mentioned a couple of other companies that will help all of you, wherever you are in the NFT space, help you be more efficient, help you protect your rights, help you have a good experience 
when it comes to NFTs. My name is Mitch Jackson. I am the streaming lawyer over at streaming.lawyer. And Ira, this was fun. The ABCs of NFTs for creators, buyers, sellers, and investors. I'm so glad that you were here today, my friend. And I just want to say on behalf of everyone watching today's live and recorded show in the future, thank you for your time and thank you for your expertise. It means the world to me. Thank you for having me, Mitch. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks, Ira. Have a great one. Everyone make each day their masterpiece. Take care. Hang on, Ira.